Hello and welcome to virtual worship. So excited to be able to connect with you and allow this uh, virtual technology to allow us to connect with one another and particularly to connect with God. So glad that you have joined us and uh, look forward to uh, the next moments together. And it is my prayer as pastor here at Mariner United Methodist Church uh, that uh, you would be not only inspired, uh, but fed and uplifted as we reflect upon God's work in our lives. Uh, just a reminder once again that we do have in-person worship each and every Sunday in the church sanctuary at 10 o'clock in the morning. And so uh, when your schedule and health allow you to worship with us uh, on Sundays in person, uh, we'll be here. With that in mind, as we uh, mentioned, we are here to worship the Lord. Let us join together in the Apostles' Creed, one of the great affirmations of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please join me in God's invitation to worship this day. We hear a voice call our name, and we know our risen Lord is with us now and always. Christ is risen. We have a message to preach to all. Christ is risen. Christ lived and preached love and forgiveness amongst us, and we are witnesses to his mighty acts. Christ rose from the dead and appears to us still. Come, let us worship the God of love and of life. We always like to extend an opportunity to our younger worshipers to uh, connect with God as we do, fully recognizing that young is a relative term. Uh, it may mean young in age, it may need uh, young at heart. And wherever you find yourself today, it is my prayer that the following would aid you in getting to know God a little bit better. What's that word? Solitude. Solitude, let's talk about it. Solitude is when you spend time alone with God. It's a special time you set aside to simply enjoy being with God. God wants us to practice solitude. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. This means that God wants us to spend time with just Him. And one way to know God better is to practice solitude. God told lots of people in the Bible to practice solitude, like Jacob, Moses, and Elijah. God spoke with Jacob when he spent time with him alone. Moses met regularly with God so he could learn how God wanted him to lead God's special family, the Israelites. And Elijah learned through his alone time with God that he speaks to us in a still, small voice. The best example is Jesus, who often went away to be by himself and pray. That's right! Jesus, who was perfect and rescued us so we could be close to God, spent time alone with God too. Jesus practiced solitude often, even after performing miracles, when he was sad, before choosing his disciples or followers, when he was worried, and any other time he needed. And if Jesus practiced solitude, it's a good idea for us to practice it too. Because God wants us all to practice solitude. It's kind of like trying to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a friend at a busy dinner table where everyone's talking at the same time. All those other voices would make it pretty hard to hear what your friend is saying. When we practice solitude, it's easier for us to hear from God. Now, it can be hard to make time for solitude when there's always something to do. Schoolwork, reading, going to practice, or screen time. None of these things are bad, but it's still important to find a moment where it's just you and God. Maybe solitude looks like sitting quietly for a few minutes, reading your Bible on your own, Journaling for a few minutes when you have a moment to yourself, a silent prayer right before you go to bed, or before you start your day, or just doing something by yourself with God. God doesn't expect you to practice solitude perfectly. He just wants to spend time with you. And that's what you need to know about solitude. I'm always amazed that we serve a God who has created and sustains the universe around us, and yet a God who takes such a personal interest in you and in me and where we happen to be this day in our own spiritual journey. And so as we come to the Lord now in prayer, I invite you to remember that God is here, God is with you, God is with us, and God hears and answers. We'll give you a few moments as we begin of uh, silence for you to uh, maybe just quiet your mind, quiet your heart, uh, perhaps lift to the Lord some praise and or petitions uh, that are particularly personal to you, to your family, to your loved ones. Following that, I will invite us to uh, pray together, a prayer that I will display here on the screen, and we'll conclude our prayer time as usual as we recite together the prayer that Jesus himself has taught us. With that in mind, I invite you to take some time now and just focus and pray to the Lord on your own. Please join me in this prayer. O oh Lord, we ask that you would bless us at Mariner United Methodist Church, 
with vision for the future and reverence for the past. Uh, guide us each day as we minister to one another and to the world for which you gave yourself. Help us each day to bear witness to your name and do that which you would have us do. For we ask it through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And then this prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, some of you may be aware that uh, one of the ministries uh, that uh, we have here at Marin United Methodist Church is uh, two to three times a year, we have a really, really big yard sale. Uh, short of a flea market, it's probably the largest sale here in Spring Hill of its nature. And uh, we held uh, one of those yard sales just a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, God, uh, through the yard sale, enabled us to raise about $7,800 towards the work and mission of Mariner United Methodist Church. Uh, in addition to uh, any number of our congregation who got to know one another a little bit better and to represent Jesus to our neighborhood by our demeanor and kindness as they came amongst us that day. That said, the primary way that God uses to uh, sustain the material needs of his church is through the tithes and offerings of God's people. Certainly things like yard sales and other ventures are helpful. Uh, they can kind of add to it, but the primary way is through God's people uh, investing in God's work through tithes and offerings. So this day, as uh, we uh, continue to uh, minister the grace of God in many and varied ways, we invite you to uh, participate in the giving of tithes and offerings by mailing them here to the church uh, by U.S. mail. You can bring them here by the office. Uh, there is a lockbox outside if we uh, don't happen to be here at the time. And uh, maybe one of the most efficient ways is online uh, via the website at marinerumc.org. And you'll find a link there that you can click on and it will lead you through the online giving process. With that in mind, I'd like to pray for you and pray for each gift and each giver. Father, thank you for the generosity of your people. Thank you that through these tithes and offerings, Lord, we can tell you that we love you and we can enable ministry to help other people know how much you love them. To that end, we surrender them to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty we'll behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall
shall tread the streets of gold when we all, when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all, when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. As a pastor, I have often have occasion to uh, visit one of our local hospitals or other healthcare facilities to visit a member of the community or of our parish that uh, Lord is, uh, well, is going through a bit of a rough time when it comes to their health. And when we talk about our health, uh, occasionally we may use uh, a term uh, called major versus minor surgery. Uh, minor surgery being one that we just assume is kind of no big deal. It's small, it's minor, it's kind of in and out. Major surgery, well, maybe a little bit more involved and maybe a little bit more risk involved as well. But the reality is, when it comes to our own personal surgery encounters or needs, there's no such thing as minor surgery. <laughs> in fact, I heard one, one, someone say once, the only minor surgery is the surgery happening to someone else. And uh, I've had occasion to have what uh, many would consider minor surgery. Uh, and uh, I realize that that moment, that it doesn't seem so minor when it's happening to me. We are in the midst of a series of messages and worship themes simply called the Not So Minor Prophets. It is based on the reality that the books of the Bible are organized according to a pattern and uh, the pattern of the prophetical writings in the Old Testament, uh, there's a section that uh, is known as the major prophets, a section known as the minor prophets, of which there are about 12. And the only really difference between them is the length of the books that they left behind. And so uh, when we talk about the, quote, minor prophets, they're really not so minor, not so minor at all. They have a major mis message for each and every one of us. And today we come to one of those particular, quote, minor prophets by the name of Micah. And I'd like to share with you a scripture passage from uh, Micah's book that uh, I think many of us will find familiar. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, even though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until a time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. That particular passage is a passage that if uh, you're familiar with uh, the Christmas season at all, uh, know that it is often a passage we refer to at Christmas because it is the, the prophecy that promised that when the Messiah came, when Jesus came and was born, that that birth would take place in the village of Bethlehem. Uh, we know that it was the scriptures that uh, were told to the wise men as they journeyed to find the baby Jesus uh, that identified Bethlehem to be the place of his birth. And so that's kind of the typical way we refer and go back and, and look at this writing. But we need to remember that uh, this, uh, this prophecy of Micah's was a little bit more than just giving us a location. Okay, it tells us a little bit more uh, than just the location of where the birth would take place. 
It also gives us some information about the nature, uh, the attributes of what the Messiah would be. Attributes that identify him, not just uh, another baby born, but born a savior, born a Messiah, born to rule, born to be king of kings, uh, born as the promised one. And uh, Micah's prophecy gives us an idea, not just where, but what he would be. You know, Bethlehem was a relatively small, out-of-the-way village. Now, today in the urban sprawl around Jerusalem, it's just kind of incorporated into that urban sprawl. It's about five miles south of the city of Jerusalem, and Bethlehem is still there. Uh, but in the time of Jesus, uh, which uh, was several hundred years even after Micah prophesied, the population of Bethlehem was only about 400 people. It, it was a minor little town pretty much throughout the Old Testament. And uh, the fact that it was the place where God determined that the Savior should be born gave it a significance that had nothing to do with its physical size or its population. It had everything to do with who was going to be born in that manger in Bethlehem. You know, that story strikes me as significant because so often we gauge significance on the basis of size. Something that is bigger is naturally uh, more important, more successful. Well, it's just, well, more. And, and because of that, uh, we often uh, attach a significant that uh, is not necessarily warranted by the size, Conversely, sometimes we think that which is smaller, uh, less expensive, uh, something that maybe is not easily noted or noticed, uh, all those things would relegate that place or that item to a place of, well, minor significance or even insignificance. The story of Micah's prophecy and the fact that he identifies Bethlehem not as just the place, but the nature of the Messiah that would be born there reminds us of the fact that in God's sight, just because you might be small in terms of how the world measure things does not mean, does not mean that you are insignificant, particularly when it comes to the nature of our Savior. So for a few moments, I'd like to take a moment and go back to the prophecy once again that Micah gave us and see what it tells us. What does it remind us about the nature of the Savior that is ours this day? One of the things that is told us in this particular passage is that uh, um, Bethlehem, as I mentioned, was a small place. It was a small place in Micah's day. It was still a small place in Jesus' day. But uh, the Messiah that would be born there is going to be born uh, as uh, God's eternal son. God's eternal son. What does the, what does the eternal mean in this context? Well, for one thing, uh, eternal means that he's always been. He's always been. Now, why is that important? Well, for one thing, it identifies the Messiah, the baby born in Bethlehem, as God himself. Uh, we get a, an idea here that the descriptive terms that are used about the baby to be born in Bethlehem are primarily descriptions of God himself. And that the claims that Jesus made to be the Son of God, to be the unique Savior, the God-man uh, uh, put together uh, in, the, in form, uh, this is something that um, God had always planned, and it substantiates Jesus' claim to divinity. And that's one reason why this is so, so important. Out of you will come one who be ruler of Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient of times. That reminds us that uh, eternity is a hard thing to grasp at times. Now, we can usually think of eternity as it moves forward from the point in time that we are at today. We can't understand it fully, we can't fully appreciate it, but at least we have some idea that something can begin at a point in time and then live forever after that. Now, we know that uh, as we live forever, it'll be in a new world, in a new place, in a new heaven, in a new earth that God is preparing for us. But that said, uh, we often think that um, 
And we can imagine at least something like that. It's very difficult for us to imagine. We don't have a frame of reference to think about someone or something that has been eternal from the past, who never had a beginning point, so to speak. But that is exactly what this passage says will be true of the Messiah. It says that Jesus is someone who's always been. Now, when he entered into our lives through the birth of Bethlehem, the, the nature of his presence amongst us changed, but his substantial nature did not change. He was already God. He'd been God. He was part of the Holy Trinity. And, and this is important to remember because this descriptor of Jesus is someone who is from ancient of days. It is a promise of one who would come not just as a human, but as God become humankind. Fifteen years of biblical history and another 2,000 uh, since then uh, is to understand that uh, as long as we've known Jesus, he's been around forever. Secondly, Micah's uh, prophecy about the nature of Jesus reminds us that as an eternal being, he's not always been, he's always here. He's always here. Coming back to the passage for just a moment. We are told that he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. You know, shepherding is an intensely personal uh, venture. Uh, it requires a lot of attentiveness. It requires a shepherd, as uh, we read throughout the scriptures, that is good and cares for the sheep and is not simply in it for the money, so to speak. It's someone that when one sheep wanders off, he'll, uh, he'll go find that single sheep and bring them back to the fold. And so uh, when we think about the fact that Jesus is always here, we're reminded that though he is always here to be our shepherd in the presence, even though he's always been, he is just as present with us in the moment. He is our good shepherd. Now, sometimes we don't experience uh, his presence in the way that we would hope. Uh, sometimes we, like that one sheep, wander off a bit, and we kind of uh, get lost in the wo woods, if it will, uh, and uh, maybe we just kind of get a little slack in uh, cultivating our relationship with God. But God comes looking for us and brings us back. And so this Savior that Micah predicted uh, his eternal nature reminds us that as he's always been, he is always here, and we are never abandoned in the moment. We have a good shepherd in Jesus Christ. So no matter what eternal, uh, eternity in the future holds or what eternity in the past, what events have transpired before we arrived on this planet, we know that Jesus is as much with us today as he was with those who have come before or will come after. Which leads me, I believe, to a final observation from this passage that I think is very, very important. Because Jesus is always eternal, both from the past and to the future, not only has he always been, not only is he always here, but he always will be. Not only has Jesus always been, not only, not, not only is Jesus always here, but he always will be. There never will be a point in the future where Jesus isn't. And that is important because, well, I think most obviously and most often we think about that regarding our own eternal life. The fact that we have promised that those who trust in Jesus, even though this body of flesh someday will die, our soul, our spirit will live on for eternity in the presence of Christ. And that eventually that spirit will be clothed with a new eternal incorruptible body that will last forever. And so we, we live with that promise. And so knowing that Jesus will always be is a reminder of the own hope that you and I have in a Savior that will lead us throughout eternity. And as much as he's been in the past, as much as he's with us in the present, we have the promise that he's going to lead us in the future. There's another reason why I think that is important to remember, though. Most of us, most of us have family loved ones, friends, that when we close our eyes to this world, when we breathe our last in this life and open up our, our eyes and our soul to the life beyond, there will be a legacy behind us of relationships that we have cultivated over time. Uh, children, nieces, uh, nephews, loved ones, 
uh, close family friends, whatever the case may be. These are people that we deeply care about and have learned to deeply care about throughout the ages, uh, throughout our uh, life here on earth. We deeply care about them. And, and one of the questions that I know I have, as I think about people that I love and care for so deeply, particularly my family, but others as well, is how are they going to do when I'm not here? You know, right now, I have the opportunity to, to minister God's word, to, to be there for them, and, and uh, to cultivate and in and, and some way be their form in life's ups and life's downs as well. But who's going to be with them when I'm gone? This verse reminds us that just as God is there with us today, this as he's always been, just as he always is for you and me today, just as he will lead us into eternity, in the same way he will be there for those who are left behind when we move on to eternity. And we can live with the confidence that even though we may no longer be with them, Jesus is, and he will care for them and shepherd them just as he has shepherded you and me throughout this life. Jesus, the Son of God, prophesied by Micah. He is a Messiah who's always been. It tells us he really is God. He's a Messiah that's always here, is represented by the way that he shepherds us through life's up and downs. And he is a Messiah who will always be, which reminds us that as he will be there for us throughout eternity, he will also be there for the legacy of those we leave behind. God bless you today. He loves you so very much. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him shall I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Jesus.